All right, in this video, we're going to begin our look at the next big idea in biology, which is evolution. And we're going to talk about evolution of population, or what we often refer to as population genetics. So one important thing to understand is that individuals don't evolve, populations do. Natural selection acts on the individual of the population, but that's not causing individuals to evolve. Selection creates differential survival. We talk about survival of the fittest. Darwin used that term. It also creates differential reproductive success. In order for individuals to pass their genes on to the next generation, they've got to survive and they have to reproduce. So the individuals that are best at surviving and reproducing, their genes are going to get passed on. Their traits are going to get passed on to the next generation. So individuals don't evolve, populations do evolve. So when the individuals in the population change their allele frequency, that changes the overall allele frequency of the population. So evolution is basically changing the genetic makeup of a population over a period of time. Favorable traits become more common because they create greater fitness or better survival and reproduction. So we can see some examples here of where populations are going to change. You can see you have some grass growing on what was a mine site before. You can see the pocket mice in desert lava flow. In the, in the, the lava flow areas, you're going to see darker mice. In the, in the non-lava flow, you're going to see lighter mice, and so on and so on. So you can see you know, how tolerance for the toxic chemicals be becomes more common in the mine sites versus non-mine sites. You can see how the number of spots on the fish change. You can see how insecticide resistance becomes more and more common, and so on. So again, just a reminder, individuals don't evolve, they survive or they don't survive. They reproduce or they don't reproduce, which causes the population to change. Okay. Let's talk about this idea of fitness. So fitness has to do with the traits that make the individual most likely to survive and reproduce successfully in a given environment. So here we have water striders, which are those bugs that, that can walk on the water, if you will. So there's a couple of traits we can look at. We can look at body size and egg laying. The bigger they are, the, the more eggs they lay per day as an adult. You can see the graph there. But there's also this idea where body size affects lifespan. And you can see basically a general turn, a trend where the larger they get, the fewer number of days they live. So there's this optimal body size where you get the maximum number of offspring produced within a lifetime. And that's what this last graph here is showing us. And it's a combination of those two factors, lifespan and body size. So one thing that's really important in order for natural selection to work, there has to be variations in the population. If every individual population is the same, there's nothing for nature to select. So variation is the raw material upon which natural selection acts. Not only does that have to be variation, but that variation has to create differential survival and differential reproductive success or some individuals must be more fit than others in that environment. So where does the variation come from? Well, it comes from mutation originally. All variation within a species is the result of mutation at some point where a gene changes, it creates a new phenotype. If that new phenotype is beneficial, it becomes more common in the population.
sex creates variation. Sexual reproduction in particular creates variation. It recombines alleles through the random mating, through the uh, genetic recombination that occurs during independent assortment, uh, segregation, during meiosis, uh, and so on. Basically, each individual is a new combination of alleles for all the traits. So what causes evolution to occur then? Well, there are five things that can cause evolution. Mutation is one. If you have a new allele, that's going to change the allele frequency in the population. Gene flow is another. If individuals leave or enter, they're taking or bringing their alleles with them. If there's some type of trait that creates greater reproductive success, or in other words, if there's non-random mating, a genetic drift, and it's something that happens in small population, and then there's natural selection. If you're a caterpillar and you're green and you live on, live on green leaves, you're less likely to be seen and eaten by birds than one that's blue. So let's talk about each of these just a little bit. So mutation creates variation. Mutations create new alleles. Now, those mutations may just be random changes because of a mistaken copy in the DNA. They could be caused by environmental factors like UV light as well. Some mutations are harmful. They're not going to become more common. Some have really no effect, and some are beneficial. So again, did it change the amino acid sequence? We know that if you change the third base, there's a good chance it's not going to change the amino acid. Did that change change the protein structure and function? Did it make it work better, make it work worse? Did it affect fitness? Gene flow. Movement of individuals and their alleles in and out of the population. Um, an example of this, seeds and pollen distributed by wind or by insects. Migration of animals. So you may see subpopulations in an area that have different allele frequencies from other subpopulations, and so they can move back and forth and they can change the allele frequencies within those subpopulations. If there's a mixing within those subpopulations, they tend to become less variable and more similar. If they become isolated, they tend to become more different and may actually become new species over time. So human evolution today. Gene flow in human populations is increasing. We have individuals that no longer tend to live within small groups and interbreed in those small groups. We have the ability to move around the world in a much more uh, dramatic and a much more easy way in many cases. So are we moving towards a blended world? No. Is the human population and this idea of race going to have to change? Non-random mating, sexual selection. In most species, it's the females who are, who are picky. They're going to choose the male with the specific traits that are going to provide the female's offspring with better chances of surviving and reproducing in the next generation. And the main reason for this is that reproduction is expensive in terms of energy and things like that. And for most species, the females put a lot more energy and time into reproduction than the males do, so they're going to be more picky. Genetic drift happens in small populations more so. It's, it's the result of random chance. If you've got a population of finches that has a variability where you have some yellow and some red ones, you have some that move out to an island, the chances that the individuals on the new island are going to represent the allele frequencies from the mainland are pretty small because it's going to be random which ones go out there, plus the environment's going to change and be different as well. So there's two types of genetic drift that we see that most commonly affect population. One is called founder's effect. That's where a subgroup of a population moves somewhere else and starts a new population. Again, typically they're not going to be the same genetic ratios from the main population. 
in the bottleneck effect. This is what happens when species numbers and individual population number sizes get very small. You have fewer individuals you can mate with. You tend to, to mate with individuals that are genetically more similar to you. If we have some recessive diseases that we are carriers for, those when you mate individuals in small populations, they tend to become more likely to occur because you're having matings within closer relatives and we see changes in allele frequency. You know, natural disasters can also cause bottlenecks. So here's, so again, we talked about the founder's effect. Sometimes rare alleles may be higher frequencies, others may be missing within that population. It skews the gene pool of the new population. Here's an example. Type O blood worldwide is the most common blood type. But we can look at this blood type and we can kind of determine where did the individuals from that population, maybe where did they originally come from by looking at the percentage of individuals that have that this particular blood type. South America, almost everybody's type O. We see that in Central America and parts of the southwestern U.S. But in places like Europe and Asia, it's much less common. Type B blood is very rare in North and South America, much more common in Asia and Europe. So this can give us a pathway of migration of the first humans out of Africa. A bottleneck, again, natural disaster, loss of habitat, famine, something that has dramatically reduced the size of the population. You're going to oftentimes randomly lose alleles as you go from generation to generation. That that loss of that allele, not due to fitness, it's due to chance alone. Again, genetic drift typically affects small populations more so than large. Uh, cheetahs have been endangered for a long time. Their population size they're got very small because they're, they're interbreeding or inbreeding. Genetically, there's not a lot of diversity there. And it'll take time for nature to put that diversity back in through mutations and other means. So there was actually two bottleneck events that happened in the cheetah population. About 10,000 years ago, we had an ice age. Cheetahs are not adapted to ice. And the last 100 years, poaching and loss of habitat created another one. So bottleneck effects have conservation issues. It's easy to lose alleles from gene pools in very small populations. It reduces variability, reduces the ability to adapt. So when species, even when they come off the endangered species list because their numbers have come up, it's still important to provide some protection for them because if something happens in their environment, they're less likely to be able to adapt and more likely to, for their population size to drop dramatically. So we, when we have breeding programs, we try to take different groups and interbreed them to, to generate some variability in the offspring. And then natural selection is the fifth way that, that populations evolve. Differential and survival reproduction due to change in the environmental condition. Kind of the, 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 the primary study that oftentimes is cited is on peppered moths. And you can see here in the picture, you got light colored and dark colored peppered moss, and in this case, the dark colored moss blend in better, so the light color would become less common. This is what we saw when, when pollution was, was much more common in England. As we cleaned up the environment, trees had less pollution, less soot, the white moss became more common. Climate change, uh, food availability, the, the presence of predators, parasites, and disease, all can cause natural selection. Toxins in the environment. So 
at least to what we call adaptive evolutionary changes. Individuals that have the best adaptations are more likely to survive and reproduce and pass those adaptations on to the